Hello, my name is Catalina Delgado. I'm going to be presenting gastrointestinal disorders and autism. So I just want to uh, take a minute and thank you all for joining us. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Brett Bod. Uh, I'm not a professional doctor and I'm not going to be giving medical advice, uh, but I'm just going to be sharing my experience with you and also uh, just giving you some information I found online that might be helpful for this specific topic. Uh, in a minute, we're going to cancel all the microphones so that we kind of cancel out the outside noise. But once we finish this webinar, you're more than welcome to ask any questions and we can just have like um, an interactive uh, Q&A at the end. If you're not currently watching this live, then uh, we would ask that you record your questions and then uh, send it into to Brightbot and someone, either me or someone else on the team at Brightbot, it will respond back to your question as a video. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this. So we'll start off with what gastrointestinal disorders are. So um, there's a few different, there's a lot of types, but the ones that I'm going to focus on are just ones that are very prevalent within the autism community. And so all, all these affect your gastrointestinal system from your mouth to your esophagus, stomach, all the way down to your intestines and your rectum. So now these four types that we're going to focus on, gastro gastritis, GERD, irritable bowel disorder, and food allergies and sensitivity. So now gastritis is just an inflammation of the lining of the stomach. And it can either be something that just happens all of a sudden, or it can be something chronic. You have GERD, which is a gastroesophageal re reflux disorder. So basically, you just have a lot of reflux in your body, and it just kind of irritates your esophagus. And then you have irritable bowel disorders, also called IBS. And this is just an irritation of the intestinal line and it causes a lot of cramping and gas, which will later go on to the symptoms of it. And the last thing which we will focus more on later is food allergies and sensitivity, because that's a very popular topic within the autism community and about certain diets. So we'll be touching upon that later. So exactly how prevalent are GI disorders within the autism community and children with autism? So there's many studies out there, I mean, just within researching for this webinar, I found many, and there is this pretty um, helpful graphic, and it just kind of shows that regardless of the different studies that were done by different researchers, it all showed that children with autism were the ones that had the highest rates of gastrointestinal disorders compared to either neurotypical children or children with other de developmental disorders. Children with autism were three to four times more likely to suffer from chronic diarrhea and constipation compared to other children. They also have more GI problems than siblings so uh, that are not affected by autism. And it's been shown that gastrointestinal disorders can affect the severity of autism. Now that's speculation. There's not really been any specific research that has um, proven that yet. But if you start to think and just wonder like, um, gastrointestinal disorders cause a lot of pain, they cause anxiety, they cause stress. And so for someone who is not very well communicating, like an individual with autism that can be nonverbal, it's a lot harder for them to communicate their pain. And so these gastrointestinal disorders can really aggravate their symptoms and can aggravate their behavior towards other people and things of that nature. Another um, issue that arises with gastrointestinal disorders and just like nutrition and children with autism is that uh, individuals with autism are, tend to be kind of picky when it comes to certain foods. And so in that pickiness, and maybe it's because it's a sensorial thing, um, they're not able to have as much nutritional value in their food. So sometimes because they don't get as much nutrition as they need, then their, gas, their gastrointestinal system uh, isn't working as well just because they're not getting the food that they need to be more nutritious. So these are common sy symptoms of GI disorders. Um, basically, there's vomiting, there's uh, bloating, nausea. Uh, irritable bowel disorder is very, it's very common to have gas, uh, abnormal like uh, bowel movements. And so when it comes to having a child with autism, maybe some of the symptoms aren't as obvious, or maybe because they can't communicate it, it's harder for you to notice 
if they're suffering from any type of symptom. So there's specific types of symptoms that could be related to gastrointestinal disorder, especially reflux when they're just like can't hold their food down. And so these could be something like when they start to chew their shirts and you notice that like their shirts may be like wet or soggy all the time, or maybe your child eats like out of nowhere just starts to eat too little or eating too much. Uh, maybe they're chewing their fingers or they're excessively chewing their food and they're taking way too long to eat. And all of these could be things that maybe they're trying to suppress uh, their pain in their gastrointestinal disorders or their reflux. So if they're eating too much, maybe they're trying to use food as a barrier. And so they get some sort of relief from like the food and the, um, the acid in the stomach. But sometimes they're eating too little because they kind of are worried that they might be in pain once they start eating. So they kind of just start like to stray away from certain foods. And um, it could also be a sensorial thing that they're trying to put things in their mouth, maybe they're teething, but it's just, symptoms to keep in mind and to take notice of, and especially bowel movements, that's a big tell-all. So if you see that your child has, there has been some sort of change in their bowel movements along with, you know, behavioral problems, then it's, it's always a good idea to talk to your doctor about this. So what is the difference between food allergies and food sensitivities or food intolerances? So they have some symptoms in common, like nausea, stomach pain, diarrhea, vomiting, so these are all things that you can observe if your child is like holding onto their stomach or they're having problems eating or you know diarrhea or vomiting, then you know flags start to rise. Now the difference between food intolerance and food allergy is a little critical because food intolerance is something that can be treated and it's something that's gradual, but food allergies can be life-threatening. So it's something to really keep an eye on. Uh, food intolerance, you know, gas, cramping, bloating, and it's all just Maybe they eat a certain amount of food too much, and then you start to notice that they're having these symptoms. But with food allergies, they could have a little bit of food and automatically the reaction arises. And so the most common uh, foods that can either give a rise to food intolerance or food allergies are here in this picture. Um, and so just like keep an eye, especially with these types of food, if you start to notice that your child is reacting in a certain way, that maybe it's something that you should bring up to your doctor especially when it comes to if they're short of breath, they have hives, that their mouth is, face is swelling, that's definitely a sign of food allergy and something that you should bring up to your doctor. So now you're uh, planning to talk to your doctor about certain symptoms that maybe you're thinking about that your child um, with autism and gastrointestinal disorders or sensitivity or a food allergy. So you should always visit your general physician first and then get a referral to a, a specialist like the gastrointestinologist. Um, if it's a child in pediatric, they have um, those type of specialists and um, always try to be as specific as possible. So when you're going to the doctor's visit, you know, always have a record of um, like your child's symptoms and when they occur. If you notice maybe around uh, they eat certain foods and they're uh, symptoms come or uh, happen or how bad are their symptoms or at what time of the day things that can help really help your doctor so that they understand and they can help you and then talk to the specialist as well and also ask them about different treatments there's many treatments out there non-medicated and medicated and so you just you really want to be well informed in this and even if it takes a second opinion it's always best because you never really know and like especially if your child is not completely commutative or verbal, then you want to make sure that you're trying to leave their pain if they are in any pain because of a GI disorder. So what are the possible treatments? So I, I mentioned medicated and non-medicated. Um, there's a lot of medicated treatments out there, a lot of uh, medicated treatments that are in clinical trials or just came out, um, like doctors, there's a lot of speculation around that. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the non-medicated ones um, that had to do with dietary treatments. So when it comes to supplements, so as I mentioned earlier, children with autism, they tend to be picky, whether it's uh, because of a sensorial input or because they um, just choose not to eat some, some food like any other child. Um, sometimes they start to be deficient in certain nutrients. So then your, your doctor might think it's best to start to give them supplements, whether it's fiber, vitamins, calcium, iron, protein, those are usually the most deficient in children with autism. 
and these can affect their mood. It can affect certain biological reactions. So it's something that shouldn't be taken lightly, uh, something that you should talk about with your doctor. So now when it comes to the casein and gluten-free diets, this is something that's very popular nowadays. A lot of uh, foods are marketed, you know, gluten-free and casein-free. So now casein is found in dairy products and gluten is found in wheat, barley, and rye. And so they're pretty uh, prevalent in the diets that normal people have. And so when it comes to restricting a child or an individual with autism from casein or gluten, it's pretty hard because it's in a lot of food. And so it's not only, it takes a lot of effort because you have to take away a lot of their food, but it's also pretty costly. So if your child is not able to eat gluten, I mean, at school, you have to pack them their own food because you never know what they could be serving at school or like at any birthday parties or at anywhere that they, they're around food, like there always has to be an option for them. And then the same goes with casein. And so uh, something else you shouldn't take lightly when it comes to deciding whether you want to put your child on a casein gluten-free diet is that those are really important nutrients. Uh, they have a lot of proteins for the body. And so if you want to restrict them, maybe because it could be a good option for certain people, but you, ha you can't take it lightly because then you might be taking nutrition away from them. So you always want to consult with either a dietitian or nutritionist when it comes to making sure that if you're taking away casein or gluten, that you're trying to supplement uh, those gaps with another type of food. Uh, there has been many studies done on casein and gluten-free diets. And as of now, there hasn't been any uh, set answer as to if it's really that effective or not. As of now, it, studies haven't shown that it, it's, it's effective, but through parents and word of mouth, people say sometimes they have luck when it comes to their child. Um, so you have to be objective when it comes to your own child. And um, I, there's some tips if it comes to, you wanna put your child on this type of diet. You wanna get as many people involved in their life uh, to help you keep them on the diet. So for example, their therapists, their teachers, uh, other family members, so that they help uh, not only uh, make sure that they're eating the foods or not eating the foods that they're supposed to be eating, but also, to help you be objective because then they can be like a third point of view as to, oh, you know, I do see that there has been a change in your child's behavior. Or, no, you know, really, honestly, I think it's kind of in your head. So you just always want to include other people so that you know that you're just not um, like wishful thinking and trying to see things that maybe it wasn't caused by the diet, but maybe it's caused by something else. And sometimes it happens that certain parents will see a change, a positive change in their child once they go on a cast and gluten free diet. And it could just be because you're making an effort to uh, take away, uh, let's say gluten, for example, and there's, you know, a lot of gluten processed foods. So if you start to take away processed foods from that kid's diet, they're going to be healthier just because they're not eating processed foods. Maybe it's not necessarily because they're not eating gluten that they're more healthy or that they're behaving better. It's just because they're not eating uh, pro as much processed food as before. So you kind of have to make sure that if you're going to keep them on this diet, again, you want to consult and you want to do it with a nutritionist or dietitian and also to make sure that there's no gaps when it comes to their nutrition because it, they are important proteins and they're found in a lot of food. So tips for autism and food selectivity. So again, I've said it again, um, that when it comes to individuals with autism, there has been a lot of uh, showing that, you know, sometimes it might not be that they have gastrointestinal problems, but maybe they're just picky with their food. So even though that it, it's pretty easy to say, oh, you know, like, let them be picky. We can't really do anything about it. At the end of the day, they might be missing certain nutrients. And so there has to be, um, you don't want to force your child to eat certain foods, but you, you kind of have to take um, to a certain point, help them to be more, to make healthier choices with their food. And so if uh, there are certain foods that they like, for example, strawberry ice cream, then maybe you should start uh, letting them eat like strawberries on their own. Maybe like they're not that, uh, they don't have an affinity for fruit, but you should always like, that should always be an option. So for example, um, I have a little brother and he has autism and he does not like fruit. He does not eat it. We all always offer it to him. He doesn't like it. And so his behavioral therapist said, okay, you know what? I think that we should, that should be one of our goals, you know, because like all the goals for his behavioral therapy are more like school-based and 
uh, behavior towards other people. And she's like, I really think it's important that nutrition plays a role in his behavior as well. So I think that we should at least try to get him more used to seeing fruits around him and maybe he'll be more, he'll want to eat a fruit. So bananas. She's like, I, I want to see a banana in his lunchbox every time that I'm with him at his school. So just pack him a banana. He might or might not eat it, but we just want to give it to him as an option. So we did that. And for weeks, he wouldn't touch it. She would offer it to him. And that was it. We, nothing was forced. And like, he started getting more comfortable. Like he would peel the banana just to see what would happen. Uh, he licked the banana. He didn't like it at first. And it's still a process. I mean, as of now, he's still not a banana lover. But um, it, it takes it takes a while, but you know you kind of we've as a family, all of us have uh, tried to make the effort to get him to eat more fruit. And you want to do it gradually. You don't want to just one day to another just put a bunch of new food in front of your children. Uh, and again, don't force them to eat it. Let them experiment. Let them touch it. Let them play with it. Uh, I mean, don't let food go to waste. But you know, just let them get comfortable around that certain food. And if there's certain foods that maybe that they like, for example, chicken nuggets. Uh, chicken nuggets are great. I love them. But uh, unfortunately, they don't have as much nutritional values as, as other type of foods. So maybe you could offer them like fried fish or fried vegetables, something that has a similar texture that maybe has more nutritional value. And that could just be a gradual change into a more healthier choices. And also... Uh, try to be as food positive as possible. So if you want to like all sit at a table and you, and include your child or the individual with autism, sit them down at the table and just eat around them so that they uh, feel more comfortable being around certain types of food and so that, you know, you make it more of a more positive environment for them. And yeah, uh, another thing too, it's really important that in this talk and everything, you guys try to be as objective as possible. So as I mentioned before, um, I, don't, I don't think that you should run straight to the doctor and say, oh, you know, um, it could be a gastrointestinal problem that they have and like that's gonna cure their autism because some doctors have speculated that or said, you know, like certain diets can regress autism. As of now, that is not something that science has proved. And, uh, these are just all the many treatments out there that could or could not work. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to stay as objective as possible and always talk to your doctor and make sure that you're not taking away certain foods that could end up creating a bigger gap in nutrition for your child than, um, than you would have wanted. So, yes. And one other fact. Uh, you have to also remember that changing this type of behavior is not something that's going to happen overnight. And um, there's certain people that really have a problem with this, uh, certain parents who get very frustrated easily. And you just have to be patient with it because um, especially with children with autism and just people with autism, it's a lot harder for them to communicate. So imagine if they're going through some sort of um, discomfort with their gut, with their their stomach, you know, you want to be as receptive as possible and you want to give them that space to, for them to be positive about their food. And also just like be more observant because this is something that's really prevalent in the autism community. And so you might never know that it could be affecting your family member without noticing. So I hope this information was helpful in some way. And, um, Again, just always consult a doctor or dietitian or nutritionist before you think about changing their food diets in an extreme way. So, yes. And I don't know if you guys have any questions or any comments. Uh, Catalina. Yes. Um, your little brother, um, Nicholas, right? Yes. Is that the one with autism? Yes. Yes. Got a question. Um, have you noticed any of these kind of gastrointestinal distress symptoms with him? And, and, and I mean, can you tell when it's happening or when it's going to come on? Or So it, it's funny you bring that up. Um, my brother, he, he's nine years old. And he, um, we never really, my family really didn't really know about the prevalence of gastrointestinal problems and children with autism. We never really were aware of it. And so, uh, 
a friend of my mom had mentioned it to her and thought, you know, maybe it'd be, it'd be um, interesting to bring my brother to gastroenterologist just to kind of check him out and make sure everything's okay. So my mom took him and my brother, he's, he's not the pickiest eater, like for certain things, fruit, I, he just doesn't like, uh, but he takes like a really long time to eat. Like he could take over an hour just, you know, eating ice cream by the time he finishes just soup. And so he, um, he taught, he, he went in and he saw a specialist. My mom took him and the specialist was like, Oh, you know, usually when I see a new coming patient, I like to put them, I like to test for any allergies. And there's a test for that for food allergies. And it turned out that my brother is allergic to milk and he is, a milk lover. He eats cheese, he eats milk, yogurt every single day. And he's also allergic to eggs, which he loves eggs. That's his source of protein. And we were shocked. We didn't really, we never expected that out of all the things because that's literally his diet. And so um, we've been gradually, it was gradual because my, as I said, my brother loves dairy. And so we kind of, you know, like started with like coconut milk. And it's been like a process. He didn't like almond milk, soy milk, but with coconut milk, we've kind of had success with that. Cheese, still loves cheese. He eats it every once in a while, but we try to keep it at bay. And yogurt, we don't give it to him anymore. And so um, with this change in his diet of taking out the milk and also the eggs, he... um, we've noticed that he's been like less silly because he's very like, he likes to giggle a lot. And so, I mean, we, I don't want to like say like it's a direct correlation, but it could be because around the time that we started taking away the food and it takes a while for like that to like come out of your system, like the dairy and, um, and the egg protein that like he had been eating for so long, but we, we have seen a, a positive uh, benefit from that diet. I don't know exactly if it's from that diet, but I mean, it kind of happened around the same time. And also he has a problem with yeast. Uh, that happens a lot in uh, people with autism that they sometimes because they either have a gap in their nutrition or something genetic or who knows, but there's been a lot of prevalence of having like an overgrowth of bacteria and yeast in their stomachs and their intestines. And so my brother turned out that he also has an overgrowth of yeast in his intestines. And it turns out that when you have too much yeast in your body, if you, like it's normal to have a certain amount of yeast in your body, but if you start to eat a lot of sugar, for example, or a lot of carbs, processed carbs, and those start to feed, the yeast feeds on that. And so it just starts to grow and grow until it's an excessive amount. And so when you have too much yeast in your body, uh, you start to become hyperactive and you start to feel like loopy as some of the symptoms that, you know, we've heard about and I've seen online. And so my brother, like I said, he was very silly. And so my, the specialist also recommended that he um, start taking like a certain type of medication so that it can lessen the yeast growth in his body. And again, at the same time that the diet change and also uh, lessening the yeast with medication, he doesn't have any like silly outbursts anymore he doesn't have those type of he doesn't laugh randomly which is something that he would do a lot like just he would sit by himself and just start laughing and now he doesn't do that we haven't seen that from him in months and it it wasn't easy and the medication it was hard for him to take he didn't want to take it 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 tasted weird it smelled weird but it's it's worked and it we're kind of just like keeping a close eye on it. We're ta- we're working with our specialists. So yeah, but we've, I've, we've seen some positive changes when it comes to his diet change and also his medication for the bacteria yeast. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Catalina, is yeah. autism hereditary? Um, as of now, there has been no direct, uh, I guess studies that have shown exactly why, how autism is caused. Um, there has been some links that genetics plays a part in it uh, from personal experience and also what I've read and like studied at school. Uh, my, my aunt has autism and so does my cousin and my brother and they're all from the paternal side of my family. But, and that's, I mean, they have genetics in common because we all live in different countries. 
And um, just like studies in general, there has been some sort of link with genetics and autism. It's not completely proven yet. And unfortunately, I wish I could give you a more direct answer, but more research needs to be put into that and more money so that we'll know not only the cause, but then that'll be a step closer to more efficient treatment and a cure. But as of now, I wouldn't give you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, it's possible then um, that if, some, like say, the, uh, when the mother was pregnant with a child that she suffered from like any one of these GERDs or any of those things that it could be um, passed on to the child as part of um, the autism spectrum. So uh, you're saying that the, if the mother is, is suffering from... Yeah, let's say like they have it in, you know, um, genetic, it's a problem for them. The mother has that problem. The mother has autism or the mother has... No, the mother has a GERD problem. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. like a gastrointestinal problem. Any yeah, of those problems. Very, yes, mm. it's very common uh, to see, and just like children in general, uh, they, uh, like the mother, and they, they tend to carry their, like their, they call it the microflora or like the environment of their, the, their digestive system. The mother will usually pass it on to their child. Mm -hmm. And so it's very common to see that, you know, like mother and child will, will share certain like gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, but that's also like the environment plays a role as well. And like the, the diet choices of the mother and, you know, once the child, how they decide to eat but that's a, a possibility, yes. It's, they've shown links that the mother can pass on her gastro environment to her child. Yeah, so it's possible maybe at the same time when the mother is pregnant, maybe if she pays attention to her diet, um, yes. Yes, it could probably that. reduce the chances of the child getting some of these. Yes, definitely. The mother, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I, I, I understand that OB, the obstetrics, they recommend that, you know, the mother, especially when she's pregnant, to like keep her an eye on her diet. Um, Cause you know, like uh, there's such a thing as like prenatal diabetes. So like a mother will have diabetes just when she's pregnant. And so her child has a higher chance of developing diabetes when they're older. And that's because just being within the womb, the, the mother has like higher blood sugar. And so it's definitely, the mother should keep an eye on her diet and her lifestyle changes while she's pregnant because that's something that has an impact on her child, especially yeah. if, if they're at a higher risk for autism. Well, my child didn't have the autism, but he certainly got the diabetes and got it early from oh. the, pre, the pre-diabetes in, you know, when I was pregnant. Right, of course, yeah. yeah and that's something that um, is, is, yeah, the child ends up being in a higher risk when there's diabetes in the womb, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I know that the child, their sensitivity when it comes to texture with whatever they eat. What about colors? Do you find that maybe they don't like green things or yellow things? They don't eat those or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've seen and I've heard a lot. I've heard it all. And it, color definitely could be one of the many sensorial uh, issues that comes into play with food. And so, again, like going back to the tips for food selectivity and just pickiness, uh, it's something that it's gradual and something that you should give your child or your family member enough time to experiment and to play with. It's not something to, to force on your child. So, yeah, but color could play a, a could play a role in it in their pickiness for food. And do you find that they they'll eat, uh, say, for instance, potato chips, and that's all they like is just potato chips, and they'll eat that constantly? Is yes. that something you find in them also? Yes, yes. I um, I working also with children with autism that I've um, this past semester for an internship. Uh, I've seen like I would bring snacks to the children, and there's some children that were more open to it because they were all on the spectrum. Some were not picky at all. Like they eat spicy things, they eat fruit. Um, their 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 food choices were pretty uh, varied. But then there's other children that like they would have. Um, what do you call those things? I don't know if you guys have heard of like croquetas. Yeah, like the Cuban. Croquetas. Yeah. yeah. Every single morning when the child would show up, croquetas, croquetas. That's all he has for, for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, you see a lot of different things. And uh, I know it's, it's hard to like get your child or 
your family member to eat something else when they're so mm -hmm. uh, put on one thing. But when it comes to nutrition, I mean, it might be creating a gap that in the future could end up affecting their behavior or affecting their, their pain or anything mm -hmm. like that. So it's something to keep an eye on. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Catalina, gastrointestinal ab abnormalities. Yes. Is that um, something that's, a, should I say, a norm when it comes to persons with, um, with autism? Or it it's, depends on, on the person's diet and stuff like that. Well, it, the gastrointestinal issues and abnormalities um, it definitely is more prevalent. It's more, it's, there's a higher chance that a child with autism will be affected by some sort of stomach or intestinal problem compared to either children that are neurotypical or children that have some other developmental disorder. And so like, and many researchers that have been done in without like many years and everything else, it's always been um, something that's, Cons consistent and that's that children with autism just have a higher risk of, of, of developing a gastrointestinal disorder and um, there is also as I said before a link between the disorder and like the autism severity so for example but it I mean it depends on the research and there's a lot of things out there um, a lot of speculation but just like thinking about the psychology behind it, if you know, like you are like, as, as you and I, if we have some sort of problem or some issue, like let's say you're at work or you're at home and you don't feel good, your stomach doesn't feel good. You don't want to, the last thing you want to do is work or, you know, like get up, like you just want to be like in your bed and comfortable. And so for a child with autism, if you, they, they can't really communicate that they're in pain or that they're uncomfortable. So, I mean, sometimes they just want to like, they lash out or they don't know how to deal with it and they're trying to communicate and it's frustrating. And so sometimes that um, anxiety and that stress of not being able to communicate the pain can end up affecting their symptoms of autism. So they might start to uh, like, they might start to become more violent or aggressive or they might start to talk less or be more like isolated just because they don't, they don't know how to, they don't feel well at the end of the day. And so it's just something that has been seen in the autism community. But again, more research has to be done because there hasn't been really a, a set answer to this question and exactly why it happens. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I got a few. Um, you were saying at the beginning that uh, the parent needs to check the bowel movements. Is that right, or did I miss here? Yes. yes. Could you could you explain that, please? What are, so, what should what should the parent be looking for? Okay, so when it comes to bowel movements, if you start to notice that your child, um, I mean, obviously, like as they start to get older, it's a little harder to to keep uh, observing their bowel movements. But if you know, like they're having problems with getting to the bathroom, you know, like they start to have accidents, which is not something that's common for your child. Um, if they start to have excessive diarrhea, you know, like maybe like they're sick from the flu or something, diarrhea is more common, but when it starts to become a regular issue, then you need to see it. That could be a flag for one of these disorders or maybe constipation. Those diarrhea and constipation tend to be the most common symptoms of GI disorders in individuals with autism and so when it comes to bowel movements constipation if they don't pass regular bowel movements in three days or more that's a red flag or diarrhea if they're uh passing you know like watery uh stool more like three times a day or more then that's a red flag so if it's something that starts to become consistent you know more than a week then you should see your doctors and like especially keep an eye when you start to notice that it happens around certain foods that they eat so if you have some sort of suspicion you start to notice that around a certain food or a certain time of the day they start to have weird bowel movements then that's something that you should bring up to your doctor okay thank you the next question i have was about um i think it was on your food selectivity slide which is a different webinar you presented but oh. um but 
view, you were saying that it's important to allow them to, uh, I don't remember the word that was on there, to, but to explore, like to yes. something like that. Experiment. Yes. What, what, it's hard for me to understand what you mean by that, because my, my impression is that most autistic children probably aren't really ones to experiment when it comes to their food. It's, it was always my impression that they wanted specific foods that they liked and that's it. So when you say allow experimentation, what were you, what did you mean? Okay. So I, I, I agree with you in that sense. Like once they eat like six to certain foods, it's hard for them to stray from them. But again, like as a parent or as a caregiver, you start to notice that, you know, they have some sort of nutritional gap and that there needs to be some sort of, um, uh, you need to do something about it. Then when it comes to experimenting, basically you want to, first of all, like give them the choice of like having that food around. So even if like they're sitting at the dinner table eating the chicken nuggets and you want to start to offer them more fruit, then like put that on like the side next to them, like make it an option. Even if you know that they're not going to touch it, just make it more like every day that they're always going to see that fruit there. And so, you know, sometimes like maybe you could play with um, an orange in front of them, like again, not to waste food, but just, you know, like kind of peel it in front of them or, you know, like let them play with it, let them touch it, let them, uh uh what is it uh put them like to their face like some children like they like to put things on their face just to see how it feels or how it their sensorial part of it and so in that in that experimentation it's just like to get them more comfortable with like being around a certain type of food and just you know like playing with it necessarily not that you want to play with food but in that sort of instance you just want to make them more comfortable with that food so that they know that it's an option for them and it might take a long time. They might never like that sort that type of food, but it's always worth the shot to just to like, keep it on the table every time that they're eating, just so that they know that it's there and it's not something foreign. It's something that they're already exposed to. And like, you could, again, like sit with them at the dinner table. You got, uh, maybe you're eating a vegetable next to them. So you can like eat in front of them. They might not even look at you. They might not be interested, but just make it a habit. And you don't know, like they might be observing something or they might seem interested, like, hmm, that's an interesting color. That's an interesting texture. And they might eventually reach for it. And hopefully when they put it in their mouth and, but it's, yeah, it's a gradual experimentation in all sense. That makes that. more sense. Thanks. And so one last question, you know, um, people who are not autistic, a lot of the time use food as like uh, as a comfort uh and i don't just mean the the activity of eating but specific foods can make somebody feel comfortable and i would think that i would think that that would apply to or to autistic children and autistic people more than anyone so wouldn't you, is that a bad thing wouldn't you want it to um allow an autistic child uh, to have as much comfort as possible, as many comforts as, as necessary? Yes, I agree with you. And like uh, why I reinforce that you shouldn't let, force your child to eat certain types of food. Um, and you shouldn't take away, like we talked about with the diets, certain types of food just because like you have an inkling that, oh, maybe like it'll like help their behavior unless you're uh, more sure or you, and you've consulted with a dietitian or a um, nutritionist. But when it comes to the comfort of the food, I agree with you. Um, but it, like, there's a fine line between them being comfortable, but then, you know, like not being healthy either because they might be like comfortable eating chicken nuggets for every meal of the day. And, you know, like they start to have abnormal bowel movements or they start to have pain. And so they can't even enjoy their food anymore because of the food that they're lacking, the, la the healthy food. And so... Um, and, and like some of the symptoms that we've covered for um, specifically children that are nonverbal and recognizing those types of symptoms of GI disorders, eating too little or eating too much, they both can play a part. And so it's something that you kind of have to uh, compare with their regular eating habits. So if your child usually doesn't eat too much, then it's not a symptom. But what if like they just start eating a lot out of nowhere and it's just like starts to become something consistent? They might be using food as uh, like I said, like a buffer between the actual food and the acidity in their stomach. And it's not something that they, 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 they might be doing consciously. They just start to notice that, oh, like there's a certain type of food that makes me feel better. 
And it's okay if it's like, uh, if they're eating it at a certain um, portions, obviously if they're excessively eating or eating foods that they shouldn't be eating too much of, then um, you, you'd you have to step in. But I, I agree with you that it shouldn't be something that's forced and something that is rash. It's something that you should consult with your doctor and you should talk about it with other people that are involved in that person's life, whether it's a caregiver, therapist, teachers, just to make sure that you have other people keeping an eye on that child's progress so that you're objective and you're not forcing anything and you're not um, making them less unhappy at the end of the day. It's all to make them feel better. So. Very nice. Thank you. You guys have any other questions or concerns or any anything that you've heard about this topic in the news or from other people? No. Nope. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much, and I hope this helped in some way. Thank you. Thank you.